Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Lakeland Public Television, serving North Central Minnesota. Today we are chatting with Pine River Bacchus Family Center's Leslie Bouchonville and Pillager Family Center's Betty Doss. They have generously agreed to share some of their experience with us. I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. So the services that you provide are so essential and so difficult to provide. Talk about the kinds of services that you provide to citizens in this area. We are often referred to as the hub. Um, probably a 30 or 40 mile radius, you know, and it could be more, but we do the food shelf. We have a food shelf. Um, we have the WIC clinics and the public health clinics that folks from our area can't get to the county seat to have those. And um, we do some outreach for that um, as folks come into the family center. We can, um, we have a relationship with them so we can inform them of what's available. Not everyone knows what kind of services that are even out there sometimes. Um, we also do a lot of prevention work in Pine River. Um, we've um, done, we have a couple, well, one coalition, and then we employ a regional prevention coordinator that serves 13 counties. Um, we do a home visiting program jointly with two other family centers. So the, the Pine River Bacchus Family Center is providing support in a number of different ways. You're talking mm -hmm. about food security, you're talking about uh, prevention, yep. prevention meaning trying to intervene before there is a crisis, Correct. to avoid a crisis, to finesse that. You are providing physical and mental health uh, 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 referral services and, and, and counseling. Um, so, and you cover a, a, a very broad geographic area. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about Pillager Family Center. Uh, how, does, how does Pillager uh, uh, approach the services that you provide? Yeah, Pillager is located 60 miles from Walker, which is Cass County's uh, county seat and where a lot of county services are provided. So 20 years ago when the Pillager Family Center started, it was the county and community members thought to let's open up a, a family center in the Pillager area so people didn't have to travel that 60 miles because that's a burden for a lot of families, whether it's having a reliable car or just gas money to get to Walker and back. So they decided let's open up a family center where we can offer these services locally. So Pillager was the first family center to open with this, this thought process in mind. And then it's, it has evolved over the 20 years to, um, uh, we, we also offer the, the local food shelf in our facility. And we're, we find that that's a great way to connect with people when they come in to um, ask for help for food. We can also connect them to other services, such as do they know about the SNAP program offered through the county? If they're coming in consistently for food, maybe they should apply for SNAP, and we have those um, application forms available. Maybe they need to talk to somebody in veteran services so we can refer them to those services, just depending on what the family's needs are. It's a great, um, great place to start building relationships and then seeing what families need and, and try and help them with whatever that need is. So let's talk about the definition of family, of being a family center. What do you have in common in terms of, of how you look at your clientele? What, who, are, who are your clients? And how do, you, um, how do you first meet your clients? How do you encounter your clients when they first come into contact with your organizations? Leslie, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think it's taken, um, like we've been around for 21 years, so it's taken a while for people to understand, you know, what, what we are as a family center and what we have there. I mean, we do some outreach, but we just don't have the staffing to do as much as we'd like. You can't be out on the road mm -hmm. all the time if you're also serving people and you can't afford to fund people who are out there doing that, that type of outreach. So it took a little while for, for people to get to know, and when they come in, what do they first encounter? People come in for lots of different reasons. Um, we do, you know, we will do faxing for them. A lot of people who work in the community um, fax their time cards. Um, you know, we 
our uh, resource. So people ask where they can find this or where they can find that. Or um, we also partner with um, Community Resource Connection right here in Bemidji to um, do the Minsure navigation. Right. And so that, that was a huge need. I mean, we were a large void. Cass County was a void. I mean, there was no one to do that. So when we know that we have the need, we step up and say, what can our staff do? What skills do we have here? Who wants to do it? <laughs> so it's really a needs-driven approach, right? You, <laughs> yeah. you, you look at your community and you say, what do you need? I think that's the beauty of family centers because we're each our own 501c3. We each have our own board of directors. Mm -hmm. So we can identify the needs in our community and either we we create a program to meet that need or we partner with another program mm -hmm. to meet that need. So we adopt a program that somebody else has already mm -hmm. developed to meet that need and, and you yeah. apply it to your community. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then we don't duplicate service either because we're such a small community. We try and do a lot of things to meet needs of families and, and we want to do them well. We don't want to do them just to do mm -hmm. them, but it is community driven and, and I think that's been true since the, that we started, since we started is that it's based on the needs of, com of the community that um, determine where our programs are. And, and we concentrate on that family support, those family support kind of services, basic mm -hmm. needs. What do you say to, uh, to those, and you, you hear this argument sometimes at the state level, um, and certainly you hear it on the, on the federal level, where, where uh, people assert that services like yours are not really necessary. If you just eliminated them, eliminated the funding for them, uh, saved the money, quote unquote, uh, of those services, then those communities would just trundle along, they'd be fine, people would figure out other solutions. What do you say to, to, to that type of thinking? Well, I would, I would challenge that definitely. Um, we, we, have, we know that what research says, and one of the programs we do is home visiting. So we get with the mom prenatally, and we work with the mom till, they're, till the child's three years old. Um, those are targeted home visits, and we know the dollars we're going to save if we can stay in there and right. connect that mom, teach that mom, help that mom support her through depression or whatever she's experiencing so that child can get into the school system ready to learn. Well, let's talk about, uh, about the, the impact of not doing that. If you're not providing prenatal care, then that also means that a certain number of new mothers are going to end up in the emergency room or in acute care. Yes. Um, so th there's actually a bell curve that you can look at and you can say, well, over there, this, this group of people, we, don't, we can't predict who they will be, but we know this group of people will be much larger and, and end up absorbing a lot more resource right. uh, at, right. at, at, at that end of crisis than if we are doing some prevention. Or ident identification of special needs. Both mm -hmm. Betty and I know if we can get in visiting early, the earlier we identify a child that may have special needs, and the earlier you can start addressing that, the less cost there is down the road. It's such a good point. We are beginning to discover that what used to be called special needs is just, they're just different learning attributes. They're just different attributes. And in particular, it's very difficult to individually address those different attributes, particularly if you never figure out what they are in a particular child. And so if you don't do that early uh, identification, um, how can you actually ensure that those issues do not become issues um, by, by how you interact with that child on the educational side or, 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 or in terms of of other types of care you're going to? Well, and I think a lot of learning uh, happens or doesn't happen. When it, even prenatally, we're learning how much brain development is mm -hmm. happening prenatally. Right. And then, and then after, in those first three years of, of life, how important connecting synapses in your brain and mm -hmm. how important that is for a child to be successful later on in life. If those things aren't happening, then th there, there could be um, special needs or different learning, but why not give them the best that they can have early to, because we know research tells us that brain development um, is, is, is critical during those first three years. It's such a good point because you bring up the, the prenatal issue which attaches to nutrition 
and your food shelf program. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and there's an awareness of balanced nutrition and the, the effect of balanced uh, nutrition on prenatal development. And then you also have the issue of self-medicating, um, which can lead into drug dependency, but even in the early stages of self-medication to uh, deal with uh, various forms of distress, pressure, physical pain, um, that can, the consumption of those drugs, which seems to the, cons the person who's consuming it to be just, it's just me, well, it affects a child's development. It affects a, a child's uh, DNA formation in those early years. And so bringing that knowledge, know, exactly. you know, you think that it's innocuous, it isn't innocuous. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think there are so many, um, so many ways that that relationship with the family and that trust that we can build up in a smaller setting. We don't have the label as a county or somebody that could be a threat. Take the child away. That's not what we're about. The police or child protective yeah. services. Mm -hmm. or and, and there are, I mean, there are families out there that have that view that right. that, that could happen. So for us to go in and work with that family and build up the trust, sometimes it takes a long time to do that. But once you're there, it is amazing the results that you will see. What does the future hold for your organizations? Do you feel like you're going to be expanding or shifting your, your uh, services? Do you have particular challenges that you'd, uh, that you'd like to highlight? Doing a few things well and not spreading ourselves mm -hmm. real thin, trying to do everything. So I think we've really focused on a few areas. Early childhood is is something that we find important and that we're good at helping provide that service, collaborating with the school, collaborating with the county, and providing services related that to that. We are good in delivering the basic needs support in our community with the, again, collaborating with the churches, collaborating with the school, and community members. They, uh, that's one other funding source we have is donations from, from community members. In the Pine River area, it's kind of been We've gone through a lot of strategic planning, and the most recent one, um, probably a, two or three years ago, was that you know we are a hub, so we can do those things, but we still partner. And then we had some programs, three or four bigger programs that we needed to maintain and keep them going. And I was keeping our eye out for ways that we can sustain those. Well, thank you so much for sharing the work of Pine River Bacchus and Pillager Family Centers. Leslie Bouchonville, Betty Doss, thank you very much for your service to the community and thank you so much for your insights.